Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another Serial Killer Spotlight video. I have a feeling that this one, like all the rest, is going to be very long so make yourself comfy and prepare yourself for something truly awful. I don't usually do warnings at the beginnings of my videos because I think if you're clicking on a true crime video you kind of know what you're getting yourself in for but just a little warning that this one is particularly rough. Even I struggled with some of the details here, so get yourself ready. This is the case of Fred and Rose West. And we're gonna start with the story of Fred West. I'll talk you through some of his background. So he was born on September 21st, 1941 in Muchmarkle, Herefordshire in England. He was born to Walter and Daisy West. He was one of eight children, although only six of them survived and he was very, very much his mother's favorite child. Like, and she would make that very clear to everyone. In 1946, the family moved to Moorcourt Cottage on Moorcourt Farm, which is where his father worked as a farmhand. And the children were expected to help out on the farm and they were very much put to work by their father, who was a very strict man, a strong disciplinarian, and he wasn't scared to punish his children if he deemed them to be doing something wrong, which I think was a lot of the time. Now Walter West wasn't much of a great guy, like father like son, and he reportedly would show Fred how to engage in bestiality with the animals on the farm from a very young age. But it is worth saying that a lot of stuff about Fred's childhood came directly from Fred, and he was known to be a bit of a liar, he would exaggerate everything, he was just a compulsive liar about everything. And so a lot of what Fred says about his childhood, we will never really know if it's true or not, but it is worth saying that Fred's brother Doug actually came forward years later and said that this wasn't true, his father ne never showed Fred how to engage in bestiality with the animals, but I suppose we'll never really know. In general though, it seemed like Fred and his father did have a fairly good relationship. I couldn't really find anything that showed his father ever like really severely abusing him. I think he was just a very strong disciplinarian and would punish all of his children, so Fred wasn't exactly the odd one out. Um, and I think in general they got on pretty well from what I could gather. But it probably was because Fred was just as messed up as his father. And his father had a saying that Fred would seem to carry on through the rest of his life. And this saying was, do whatever you want, just don't get caught doing it. And this is probably why Fred started to engage in petty theft from a really young age. He would just like steal random things and this would go on through his entire life. He was always just a petty thief. And it's probably because he thought he'd get away with whatever he wanted as long as nobody caught him doing it. Rumours have circulated for years that Walter West would engage in incest with his own daughters. Apparently he would use the logic, I made you so I'm entitled to have you. And it's worth saying this again that this is only a rumour because Fred told everyone this is all his father did. Um, again, we won't really know if it's true or not but honestly I'm entitled to believe that this is true because Fred would have got his mindset the way he would go on to treat his own daughters from somewhere and it's very likely from his own father. And it's very clear that Fred picked up on this because actually Fred started an incestuous relationship with his own younger sister. His sister Kathleen was known as Kitty and he started this from December 1960 um, and he got her pregnant just a few years later when she was just 13 years old and Fred was 18 at the time. And I say it started an incestuous relationship, it wasn't a relationship at all, it was pretty much rape of his own sister. And obviously it culminated in his sister getting pregnant and when his mother Daisy found out about this, she was disgusted. And she actually went to the police and told the police what Fred had done, which shocked everyone, especially Fred, because Fred was the mama's boy. He couldn't do anything wrong in her eyes, but apparently this was the line and quite rightly so. But for reasons I'll talk about in a little bit, it's actually quite likely that Daisy was just very jealous of Fred and Kitty's relationship. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, when Fred was questioned by the police about the rape of his younger sister, Fred actually admitted to the police that he would regularly molest young girls and when the officer like pushed him on it, Fred was just like, why, doesn't everybody do it? The case did go to trial, but it actually all collapsed when Kitty refused to give evidence. And so that was that, Fred walked away a free man. But let's talk a little bit more about Daisy's relationship with her children and with Fred. Like I've already mentioned, Walter was very strict, possibly incestuous. Um, and Daisy was hugely, hugely overprotective of her children, particularly her favourite Fred. And so it was a huge shock to him, like I said, when Daisy actually reported him to the police. 
But Fred wasn't a particularly smart person. His IQ is reported to be around 84, which is just very, very low. And of course, this meant that he never really did the best in school. He would always be the last one in the class, always lagging behind. And because of this, he would often misbehave, just maybe a way to get attention. Maybe that's just who he was. And Daisy apparently would regularly march down to the school in this quite a small sort of village. And she'd march down to the school and the kids would see her coming and she'd go into school and she would just scream at the teachers for disciplining her favourite child. And the school kids would say it was their favourite time of the week. They would literally wait for Daisy to come and shout at the teachers. But of course this did make Fred the subject of many a playground joke. Now Fred would later claim that his mother actually was the one to teach him about sex around the age of 12 and I'm not talking about the birds and the bees talk here. She took it to a whole new level and she would invite him to share her bed. I mean from everything we can see it looks like Fred lost his virginity to his own mother but once again this can't be confirmed. This is just what Fred has said. But Fred's actions in later life did point to him having a pretty abusive childhood so it's not crazy to think that all of this stuff he said could be true and he clearly thought that incest was a pretty normal thing. Fred left school at 15, he was pretty much illiterate and he went to work on the farm as a farmhand, but he only lasted a while on there before going to work as a construction worker. When Fred was 17, he was seriously injured in a motorcycle accident. So yes, we have yet another serial killer here with a head injury. Now the accident he had left him in a coma for a week and he had to have a metal plate inserted into his head to basically hold his skull in place. Um, his leg was also really badly broken, which resulted in him walking with a limp for the rest of his life. Then just a couple of years later, he's attending a local youth club and he attempts to stick his hand up a girl's skirt. And they're standing on a fire escape. This girl turns around and just pushes him. Good on her, I would do the same. Um, but Fred actually falls off the fire escape and he gets yet another head injury. He falls unconscious. Many experts think that these head injuries would have caused some permanent brain damage, which would have made him prone to fits of rage and it would have negatively affected his impulse control. And as I've mentioned head injuries in, I think, pretty much all of my serial killer spotlight videos now, I figured I would give you a little bit more insight on this particular topic here in this video. So I read some really interesting papers online about head injuries and this is the kind of best way that I could summarise it all. Um, so the links between brain injuries and repeated violent criminal behaviour are pretty undeniable. I mean one study from the year 2000 found that 12 out of 16 people who are currently on death row had a history of brain damage, 12 out of 16. And in many cases, this was because of more than one injury. They'd hurt their head multiple times over their lives. And a lot of the time these head injuries were actually inflicted to them by caregivers or family members. So this points to maybe a wider thing here of like, abuse in the home as well as general head injuries, but we'll focus on the head injuries here for the moment. This particular link between brain injury and violent crime is actually thought to be specifically linked to the frontal lobe, so when the frontal lobe is injured. And the frontal lobe being injured is associated with a loss of impulses, so you have no impulse control, which in turn makes people more violent. Lesions in this particular area of the brain influence social perception, self-control and judgement, and it can also lead to poor communication skills, which again leads people to get mad because they can't like say exactly what they want to say, they can't communicate in the way they want to communicate and so due to their lack of impulse control they then just strike out in a violent manner as opposed to people who have fully functioning frontal lobes and can like think through their actions if they can't communicate they have to sit down and they think about okay this is what I'm going to do. People generally with these injuries just lash, they just lash out and that's it. I don't want anyone to think that I'm making excuses for Fred or any other serial killer's behaviour but I think it's just really interesting to look at this link between head injuries and violent crime because it's something that I come across in almost every single serial killer that I've looked at here. But let's get back to Fred. So shortly before his second head injury, he actually met a girl called Catherine Costello at a dance hall. And Catherine actually preferred to be known as Rena, which I think was a name she would use whilst prostituting. Um, they actually date for several months and then Rena moves back to her hometown, which is Glasgow in Scotland, and Rena and Fred just kind of lose touch and that's that. But in September 1962, when Fred is 21 years old, 
they actually reunite. However, by the time they reunite, Rina is pregnant with another man's child. The man she was pregnant by was actually a Pakistani bus driver back in Glasgow. She had a short fling with him and it's thought that she actually left Glasgow because there was a lot of backlash about this fling. So she tells Fred about her situation. She tells Fred about how she's worried the police are gonna pick her up because she's pregnant with another man's kid. This was back in like 1962. And Fred actually offers to marry her and take all like the responsibility for the kid, say the kid was his and that's kind of that. The two marry in November 1962 and according to Fred's brother Doug, Fred didn't tell anyone in the family about the marriage apart from their brother John. Fred just comes home one day and announces that he's married and they were expecting a child and that's that. And shortly after that he actually moves up to Scotland to Glasgow with Rena. Charmaine Carol West was born on the 22nd of February 1963. But of course, Charmaine was half Pakistani, and so she was born with noticeably darker skin, and they had to come up with a cover story. Fred told his family that Rena had actually miscarried, and so they decided to adopt another child from the city. Um, a year later, in July 1964, Rena actually gives birth to Fred's first biological child, and that is Anne Marie. Everyone who knew the family at this point said that Rena seemed to be a good mother, she would struggle with money, but she did the best she could with what she had. They said the children looked happy and healthy, there was nothing to suggest they had any problems. Um, but Fred was known to treat the children quite harshly. Like his father, he was a strong disciplinarian, he would punish them for anything and everything. Apparently when he was home from work, he'd put them in what was essentially a cage. They had these bunk beds and he like put rods around the bunk bed, so it was, it was a cage pretty much. And he put the girls in there and he told Rena they were only allowed out when he was at work. In 1964, a girl called Anne McFall comes into the story. Now, Anne McFall was a friend of the family's nanny, Isa McNeil, and Anne was only 16 years old, and she begins to spend a lot of time around the West House. She seemed to have this infatuation with Fred, and Anne had actually recently lost her boyfriend in a workplace accident, so it's likely she was just projecting her feelings. And she was very clearly going through quite a hard time because Fred was genuinely a disgusting person. He wouldn't wash. Anyone who knew him said that he just had very poor personal hygiene. He would rarely brush his teeth and let alone washing anything else. He was just generally pretty gross. And it's also around this time that his sexual appetite changes. He begins to dismiss all types of vanilla sex and he demands only like BDSM, sadism, he just had all these sexual demands and honestly he kind of scared Rena from what I could figure. Eventually it became clear to Rena that Fred was anything but faithful. She wasn't meeting his sexual demands and so he was finding them elsewhere. And so she has an affair herself with a man called John. And John apparently once witnessed Fred attack Rena and so in response punched Fred in the face. And he would say years later that Fred didn't fight back when he punched him. He literally just stood there and took it. When it came to having a physical fight with a male, he couldn't bring himself to do it. But he would treat women like shit. Apparently another time, John witnessed Charmaine, who was a toddler, ask Fred for an ice cream. He was an ice cream van driver at the time. He drove an iconic Mr Whippy van. Um, and Fred just hit Charmaine across the head in response. And of course, Charmaine was always treated worse than Anna Marie because Charmaine wasn't Fred's actual child. I mean, when you first heard that Fred was taking on Rena's child, you probably thought, oh, that's a nice thing for him to do. But don't get it wrong, he was not nice towards Charmaine. He really, really abused her. In November of 1965, Fred accidentally kills a four-year-old boy when he's reversing in his ice cream van. And this is thought by pretty much everyone to be a genuine accident. He didn't mean to kill the boy, he was just in his blind spot but to escape all of the backlash he was getting from this because of course even though it was an accident he still killed a four-year-old um, Fred and Rena actually move back down to Gloucester and Fred gets a job in an abattoir of all places which is very fitting. Both Issa McNeil and Anne McFall actually move down to Gloucester with Fred and Rena. But in order to escape Fred's sadistic sexual demands, both Issa and Rena actually move back up to Scotland in 1966 and Anne and the children stay with Fred. I think Rena would come down quite regularly to Bishop's Cleeve where they all lived as she missed the children, she wanted to see her daughter Daughters. Um, but I just don't think she was able financially to take them with her back up to Scotland. Rena worked as a prostitute, I think, for most of her life, and so she probably thought she was doing the right thing by leaving them down there with their father, even though he was 
quite clearly abusive. Serena comes down constantly to visit her children and when it becomes clear to her that Fred's abusing them pretty badly, she tries to get custody back but she can't, she has no way to do it. And she very much begins to resent Anne because Anne has kind of taken on Rena's role as the mother and it's pretty obvious that Anne and Fred are sleeping together at this point. At one point, Rena's so mad that she just steals a load of stuff from the caravan where Fred and the kids live, and Fred actually presses charges against his own wife. Um, she has a trial in Gloucester, and she was sentenced to three years probation, which is kind of shocking when you hear about all of the things that Fred got away with in his life. But he had the nerve to press charges against his own wife for stealing some things, which you probably could argue were rightfully hers. Um, it was no shock to anyone when Anne fell pregnant with Fred's child in 1967. She was still infatuated with him, like nothing he would do would put her off. She was like in love. And he promised to divorce Rena and marry her, but of course at this point he has no intention to do so. She's only 18 years old and Fred is 26, so the whole relationship is questionable. And in July, when she's eight months pregnant, Anne McFall just disappears. And nobody ever reported her missing, but her remains were found buried at the edge of a cornfield between Much Markle and Kemley in June of 1994. All of her limbs had been carefully separated at the joints. The baby had been cut from the womb. Some of her fingers and toes and her kneecaps as well were all missing. And this would go on to become Fred's trademark. Whenever he buried a body, he would remove some fingers, take some toes and take away the kneecaps. And we've never found out what he did with those. They've never been found, none of them. He clearly kept them, collected them, some kind of trophy but they've never been found and never told anyone where they were. Fred originally said that Rena's pimp killed Anne. He said that he came home from work one day and the pimp and Rena were stood in the caravan having killed Anne. But then he changes his story and says that he did it after an argument and then he changes it again and says he didn't do it and goes back to blaming it on Rena. But Anne was found with sections of dressing gown cord wrapped around her wrists, which very much suggests that even if Fred did kill her, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't a moment of violence after an accident. She'd been tied up and most likely tortured. It wasn't spontaneous. So now with Anne out of the picture, Rena actually moves back in with Fred. I think she just thought that Anne had left. I don't think she ever really knew about the murder, but we'll never know. Um, and then the following year, she actually leaves Fred once again because he gets violent. Um, the girls, Charmaine and Anne-Marie, were in and out of care at this point. Fred would place them with social services when he couldn't quite be bothered to care for them. And then he'd take them back when he wanted them. He was spending time in and out of jail as well for all his petty theft. So when he was in jail, he'd just send the girls off to social services and then collect them when he was home. I mean, it's shocking really that nobody picked up on what was going on. Um, around this time, still married to Rena, he finally meets Rosemary Letts. He meets her on the 29th of November 1968, which would have been Rose's 15th birthday. Now, I'm not somebody who necessarily believes in soulmates, but these two were a match made in hell. They would go on to cause so much pain and terror. Imagine if just this one day, they'd never met. It seems like a cruel twist of fate that the universe would ever allow these two messed up people to meet. If they'd never met, how many lives would be saved? Would they have still acted the same way? Would they have done the things they'd done just on their own and said together? I don't know. So like I said, Rosemary Letts was born on 29th of November 1953 in Devon, England to Bill and Daisy Letts. Her mum was called Daisy as well. And her childhood seemed to be just as tumultuous as Fred's was. Now interestingly, when Rose's mother was pregnant, she suffered with very severe depression. And she actually received, her mother received electroshock therapy in a quest to cure her depression while she was still pregnant with Rose. Now I would say there's probably a pretty strong chance that all of this electroshock therapy may have affected Rose's development in some way. But of course there's no way of knowing that for sure. And her mother's depression affected her childhood in many ways. But her father was also mentally ill. He was a diagnosed schizophrenic, but apparently he never actually told his family about his diagnosis. They all just thought his schizophrenia was just him, but really he was very, very mentally ill. His schizophrenia caused Bill to be a violent man, and he demanded unconditional obedience from his family, from his wife. He ran, like very much like Fred's father, a very, very tight ship. He would punish children for anything and everything. They weren't allowed to speak and play like normal children. And he would do all this whilst failing to even provide for them. He would jump from low paid job to low paid job. They would really struggle for money because he just couldn't hold anything down. It's no surprise that Rose was 
let's say different as a child she had a habit of rocking herself back and forth like all the time she would just sit there from when she was a baby up until like well into childhood she would just sit there rocking back and forth it possibly in a way to soothe herself she would just sit in her cot or her pram rocking her head back and forth for hours and hours on end. She was dubbed as Dozy Rosie due to the fact that she was a lot slower than the other children and she was obviously not very intelligent. But she was smart enough to figure out how to satiate her father, how to work around his temper. She would dote on him, doing whatever he wanted her to do. She would greet him from work with a cup of tea and she'd feed him, make sure that he always had whatever he needed. And so out of all the children, Rosemary probably was on the receiving end of her father's temper the least. But rumour has it, very much like Fred and his mother, that Rose and her father had a very incestuous relationship. She didn't only figure out how to satiate him with cups of tea, she would sleep with him to make sure that he liked her the most. Which once again is technically rape on his behalf. Possibly as a direct result of her and her father's relationship, Rose would show signs of being sexually precocious at a very young age. She would reportedly walk around the house naked in front of all of her younger brothers, and she would also climb into her brother's beds and sexually assault them. Um, when she was a teenager, her parents actually divorced, and she originally went to live with her mum, but surprisingly, just to think about a few months later, she decided to move in with her father, who lived in Bishop's Cleeve, the same place as Fred. And her father's rules, and probably jealousy as well, forbade her from dating boys. But Rose's temperament just meant that generally boys weren't interested in her at all, especially boys her own age. They just would see this crazy girl with this temper, she was a little bit odd, they weren't interested, and so Rose would go for older guys. She got herself quite the reputation. I mean, when she was living with her mum, she had no rules. She could go out all hours of the night and do whatever the hell she wanted. And this didn't change when she lived with her father. She would just deal with the consequences when she got home. In January of 1968, a 15-year-old girl actually disappears from a bus stop near Cheltenham, near Bishop's Cleeve. And this was linked to several other very mysterious rapes and disappearances in the area. And so most girls living in this area were being very, very overly cautious. And Rose followed the lead for a while before figuring that she didn't really care. So she carried on. It was 1969 when Rose meets 27-year-old Fred on her 15th birthday, as she meets him at a bus stop in Cheltenham. Now initially she wasn't interested in Fred at all, he wasn't the best looking guy, like I've mentioned, his personal hygiene was very poor, but he kept going on, I think they took a bus ride together, and eventually she agreed to go on a couple of dates with him due to his persistence, but obviously it became more than just a few dates. And Rose's father very strongly disapproved of this match. He hated Fred. Particularly, he wasn't happy with the 12 year age difference between the two, but I'm sure there was most likely a lot of jealousy there as well. He threatened to call social services on Fred many, many times, because bear in mind, Rose is literally 15. And when that didn't work, he would literally turn up at Fred's trailer park and threaten him. Whether this was because he finally stepped up as a parent or was just jealous that Rose had somebody else, we'll never know. Within literally weeks of meeting Fred, Rose left her job at the bread shop and she became the new nanny for Charmaine and Anna Marie. Initially, she treated them with care like any nanny would, but this didn't last long. Rose had her own temper and she wasn't great with kids. Fred would pay Rose enough that she could convince her parents that she was still working at the bread shop, but she wasn't. She was literally pretty much living and working with Fred. When her parents figured out what was going on, and it didn't take them that long, they had her placed in a home for troubled teens in Cheltenham. But Rose was allowed home on weekends, so every weekend she'd just come back and stay with Fred in his caravan. On her 16th birthday, she was released from the home and she returned back home to her parents. And Fred at the time was actually serving a 30 day sentence for petty theft, um, but as soon as he re was released, Rose just moved in with him. At this point, he didn't live in the caravan anymore, he lived in a flat in Cheltenham. And the day he returns, he literally collects his daughters from social services and has Rose move in with him. Bill tries one last time to get Rose away from Fred, and so has her examined by a police surgeon. I'm not entirely sure how this came to be, I don't know why he wanted her to get examined by a surgeon. Um, perhaps he was looking to see if Fred was abusing her. But this surgeon discovers that Rose was pregnant. Her parents attempt to have Rose placed in care, but they actually discharge her based on the terms that she would get an abortion and return back home. 
Of course, she didn't do either of those things. She moved immediately back in with Fred. And I think at this point, her parents just kind of gave up. Whilst Rose was still pregnant, they moved to a two-story house in Midland Road in Gloucester. On the 17th of October, 1970, Rose gives birth to her daughter, Heather. Shortly after the birth, Fred is imprisoned once again, this time for car tire theft and he remains in prison until June 1971. And whilst he was in prison, Rose was left to take care of the three children. And she soon began to resent having to look after two children who weren't even hers, Charmaine and Anna Marie. Rose's temper starts to flare and she would constantly punish and beat the girls for anything and everything. Anna Marie said that she'd get really upset about all of the treatment, but Charmaine just never showed any emotion. She was stoic throughout everything. She would never like react to the beatings in any way, and this would kind of anger Rose even more. And it would get even worse when Charmaine would comment how her real mum Rena was gonna come back and collect her, and she would never treat her that way. And so it would just get worse and worse. So Charmaine definitely received the worst beatings out of the lot. But then someday on or around June 15th, 1971, just days before Fred's release from jail, Charmaine is murdered by Rose. The exact circumstances aren't known, but it's thought that she just took a beating too far, entirely losing her temper, and Charmaine ended up dying. I mean, you've got to remember, she was a child at this point. Rose simply told Anna Marie and anyone else who would ask that Charmaine's mother, Rena, had come to collect her. And of course, this would really hurt Anna Marie because Anna Marie was wondering why her mother would come and collect her as well. Um, but of course, when Fred gets out of prison, Rose tells him what's happened and Fred helps her bury the body. As always, he takes his daughter's fingers, toes, kneecaps, and then buries her under the kitchen floor of their home. But it was only a matter of time before Rena would come looking for her daughter. Rena would st still stay in contact with her kids. She'd come visit quite regularly. And she realizes that Charmaine is nowhere to be found. She can't even find out where Fred lives now. He's moved house and hasn't told her. So she goes to his family home, Moorcourt Cottage, and asks them where Fred is. They give her his address, and so she turns up at their home. And that's the last time that's ever heard of Rena. She's believed to have been murdered by strangulation, likely in Fred's car. Her body was later discovered in a similar area to where Anna McFall was buried, buried close to yew tree coppice at Letterbox Field. She had a small length of metal tubing with her, making it possible that she'd actually been restrained and subject to quite a lot of like sexual torture before she was murdered. As always, fingers, toes, kneecaps were gone, as well as her body being severely dismembered. On the 29th of January, 1972, Fred and Rose finally marry, and Rose falls pregnant again just months later. They also move out of their Midland Road house to the now infamous 25 Cromwell Street. Now, upon moving to the house, they convert many of the upper floor rooms to bed sits that they are going to rent out and earn money from. The main West household was on the ground floor and it was kept completely separate from the lodger's accommodation upstairs. And Rose actually gives birth to their daughter, Mae West, on June 1st, 1972. And throughout all this time, Rose was working as a prostitute with Fred acting as her pimp. It was a turn on for him, for her to sleep with other men, he liked it. Um, and the new house also allowed room for their prostitution business. It was a pretty big house. Um, they took photos of Rose and they placed ads in magazines all about their business, saying they were swingers, this and that. Um, but Fred was very, very particular and he only liked Rose sleeping with black men. And luckily for him, Gloucester had a very large West Indian population. Fred drilled peep holes in the wall so he could watch Rose as she had sex with these men. It was a huge turn on for him. He'd even put baby monitors in the room so he could listen wherever he was in the house, including if he was in a room with his kids. He wouldn't care. He would just listen to his wife having sex with these men and the children thought it was pretty normal. Rose would also engage in casual sex with their lodgers, both male and female. And Fred would often join in when it was a female. Regular sex, regular sex wouldn't satisfy either of them. They thrived off other people's pain and their own dominance. Sickeningly, one of Rose's best clients was actually her father, Bill. So clearly Bill and Fred put their differences aside at one point and I think they actually opened a cafe together at one point, but it didn't last very long, it went bankrupt very quickly. By 1983, over the course of her and Fred's marriage, she actually gave birth to eight children, but not all of them were Fred's. A lot of them were her clients and they were mixed race. 
Um, so the children were Heather, May, Stephen, Tara, Louise, Barry, Rosemary Jr and Lucy Anna and of course not forgetting about Anna Marie and Charmaine who at this point is already dead. 25 Cromwell Street had a large cellar which the West had big plans for. They planned to soundproof it and use it as a torture chamber and this is something that Fred actually told their neighbour Elizabeth. And Elizabeth assumed that he was joking. Like, somebody says that kind of thing, you just laugh off and think they've got dark humour. Fred wasn't joking. At one point, Fred and Rose returned home quite late and Elizabeth was babysitting for them. And Elizabeth asked them where they've been and Fred jokes that they've been out cruising around for young virgins. He says that he thought they'd be more likely to get in his car if um, Rose was sitting in there as well. And again, Elizabeth laughs off thinking it's a joke. Once again, it wasn't. Later on, Elizabeth is actually drugged and raped by the couple. Eventually, they finish the torture chamber and their first client in the torture chamber was their eight-year-old Anne-Marie. I told you guys this one is dark. Um, I, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. All you need to know is they raped, drugged, abused multiple women in this torture chamber. Um, I've read details I don't want to know and I don't really want to inflict it on you. If you want to know, you can Google it, but I just, I don't feel like I need to go into detail about what these girls endured, just know that it was very dark, very sadistic, and that's that. But yeah, the two of them raped their eight-year-old daughter, Anna Marie. Um, her father raped her whilst her mother held her down, and she was told by them that she was lucky that she had parents who cared so much about her. As you can probably guess from all this, the West children just were not treated well. They had strict guidelines, severe punishments if they didn't feel wrong. Most of their punishments were actually doled out by Rose. Um, Fred had very little to do with the day-to-day -day care of the children, including punching them. Everything was Rose, and all the children said that Rose was definitely like the meaner one of the two. And between 1972 and 1993, the West children were actually admitted to A&E 31 times. And all of the injuries were just explained away by their parents as being like accidents. They fell down the stairs, this happened. Not once did anybody ever pick up on it, 31 times. These children got failed by the system, time and time again. In late 1972, Fred and Rose pick up 17 year old Caroline Owens and they hire her as their nanny. And I mean like they literally pick her up from the side of the road, she's hitchhiking home down a country lane from her boyfriend's house, Fred and Rose are driving down the road to see this girl and so pull over and ask her to get in. Um, and so just a few days later, she moves into the West household. And now bear in mind at this point, this is 1972, so there's only three children. It's only Anna Marie, Heather and May. Rose tells Caroline that she's a masseuse, so she wouldn't question all of the men in and out of the place all day. Fred also brags to Caroline about being a skilled abortionist, should she ever require his services. And this is something he would apparently brag about quite a lot. Whenever he met a different woman, he would tell her that he was an abortionist and if she ever needed him, he was there and he was really, really good at it. It seems that he thought that this is something that women found attractive about him, but of course it wasn't. And also being the compulsive liar that he was, it wasn't even true. It's very likely that it was all just lies. And he claimed to Catherine that women were so impressed with his services that they would sleep with him to say thank you. As you can imagine, Catherine soon found herself the very centre of the West's attention. They were constantly making sexual advances on her, she would deny them, and she just found it all very, very uncomfortable. So she decides to move back home, because of course she would. But on December 6th, 1972, the couple go out driving with the intent of luring Catherine back to their home. They drive past her as she's hitchhiking down the same road where they first met her. Um, they knew this was a road she walked often, she'd be walking home from her boyfriend's house. Um, and they pull over and offer her an apology. They say they're so sorry for all their actions, they're really embarrassed and they just want to make it up for her. They offer her a lift and Catherine accepts their apology and she thinks they're being sincere, assumes that she's taken things the wrong way, feels a bit silly and so decides to get in the car. So Fred drives and she sits in the back with Rose and Rose says that she wants to have a girls chat. As Fred begins to ask some very inappropriate questions and then when Catherine obviously protests to this, Fred stops the car punches her in the head which renders her unconscious and they then bound and gag her before dragging her back to their house and they take her down to the cellar the torture chamber and they sexually assault her they rape her and this continues on until the next day and then the west just ask her to return as their nanny and she's worried about what they're going to do if she says no so she just agrees to go back to their being their nanny so she goes upstairs starts like hoovering to prove to them like yeah i'm doing my job this is it um, and then her and Rose later that day go out to the laundrette and whilst they're there, Catherine obviously sees it as a chance to escape so just runs out of the laundrette 
and runs back home. And originally she doesn't say anything to her mum. She like stays very quiet. Um, and it's only when her mum noticed that she was covered in bruises and welts and she was just very badly injured that she tells her and her mum obviously goes to the plea. The trial was due to go ahead on the 12th of January 1973 but Catherine actually decided that she couldn't go through with it. She couldn't relive all the details of her assault. Obviously it was really traumatising for her and so all the charges were dropped apart from the indecent assault and the actual bodily harm charges. They still went ahead because they could go ahead without Catherine's testimony. Um, they both pled guilty, Fred and Rose, and they were fined just £50 each. Obviously £50 was worth a lot more back in the 70s, but it's still not enough. And this is despite Fred's pretty extensive criminal history at this point. They would have looked at all the stuff he'd done and still thought, oh yeah, this is a guy who shouldn't go to prison. They allowed them both to go home and they continued their abuse. And remember at this time, Fred is 31 years old. Rose is just 19. She's 19 years old. Their first joint murder would happen just months after the court case with the death of 19 year old Linda Goff. Now Linda Goff moved into 25 Cromwell Street to look after the children. She was their new nanny and she moved in on the 19th of April 1973. By the 20th of April, Linda was nowhere to be seen. The other tenants were told that Linda had hit the children and so the West had ironically asked her to move out. Um, and when Linda's mother came looking for her days later, because she was really close to her mother and her mother knew that Linda wouldn't just disappear, Rose denied that she'd ever met her, but she was literally stood in the doorway wearing Linda's clothes. And her mum knew that, and I think her mum pointed that out, because then suddenly Rose magically remembers, and she tells her mum that Linda has said that she's moving away to Western Supermare, when in fact her remains were buried just a few feet away in the garage. When Linda was eventually found years later, she had been dismembered with her signature fingers, toes, knees removed. Her jaw was wrapped in tape and two small tubes were found in the nasal cavity. There were long sections of string and knotted fabric found with remains and it's very likely she died from strangulation. And it was actually very shortly after this that the couple's first son, Stephen, was born. And the next victim was 15 year old Carol Cooper, who was abducted on the 10th of November, 1973. Now she lived in a children's home in Worcester and she disappeared after a night at the cinema with her boyfriend. Um, she was last seen waiting at a bus stop so it's very likely that Fred and Rose just simply pulled over and abducted her into the car. Again she would have been sexually abused and likely died from strangulation or asphyxiation after about a week of torture. Um, she was also buried underneath the cellar. Little over a month later, university student Lucy Partlington disappears while she's visiting her mum over the Christmas holidays. So she disappeared on December 27th. Again, she was likely forced into a car whilst waiting at a bus stop. And again, would have been tortured for a week and then buried under the cellar. And they theorise that Lucy died on or just before January the 3rd, 1974, because on that date, Fred actually had to go to A&E because he had a very deep cut, I think it was on his hand. Um, and years later, they pretty much guessed that he probably cut his hand whilst he was dismembering her body. Obviously, both these girls, along with Linda, are reported missing, but there's nothing really to link them to the West or anybody else. The only one with a link to the West is Linda. Um, three more girls actually meet the same fate between April 1974 and April 1975. This is 21 year old Therese Singthaler, um, 15 year old Shirley Hubbard and 18 year old Juanita Mott. All of their bodies were later found buried on the property and they had bondage equipment still attached to them, tape, rope, small metal tubes. I'm again hesitant to go into more detail than that, but if you want to know more specific details, then please Google it. Throughout all of his murders, Fred was very much still attracting police attention with his continuous petty theft. Most killers would try and stay off the police's radar, but Fred, it just didn't bother him. Perhaps he thought that because he got away with so much in the past that he thought he was untouchable. At some point in 1976, the West entice a young woman into their home. Now this woman's always referred to as Miss A by the courts, I can't give you her real name. Um, she witnessed the torture and rape of two girls in the cellar. One of them was very likely Anna Marie. In 1977, they had an 18 year old lodger living upstairs called Shirley Robertson and Shirley found herself in a strange three-way relationship with the couple and she ended up pregnant with Fred's child shortly after Rose had actually given birth to their daughter Tara who was the biological child of one of her clients not of Fred. Now whilst Fred loved the fact that Rose was pregnant by another man Rose 
hated the fact Shirley was pregnant with Fred's child. And she made it very clear to Fred that Shirley had to go. And so Shirley soon joins the rest of the girls buried at Cromwell Street. By this point, the cellar was so full of bodies that he started to bury bodies outside in the back garden. And both her, both Shirley and the unborn baby were dismembered. Rose even tries to submit a claim under Shirley's name for maternity benefits. And this was unsuccessful, but that's playing a very, very risky game. She is very much towing the line here. Because all social services had to do was look into it even a tiny bit, and they would have found that Shirley was nowhere to be found. In November 1978, another of Rose and Fred's daughters is born, Louise, which is their sixth child. And that same year, Anna Marie also falls pregnant with her father's child, and she has an ectopic pregnancy. In August of 1974, the last known sexually motivated murder occurs with 16-year-old Alison Chambers, who was the West living nanny. She'd lived with them for many weeks before her murder, and she was buried in the garden. The couple actually even go as far as to send letters to Alison's family pretending to be her, so they wouldn't realise that anything was up. You're probably wondering how the children were through all of this, how nobody noticed anything. The girls were all severely sexually abused and they all dealt with it in very different ways. Um, Stephen was also threatened with sexual abuse, told that when he was 17 he was going to have to have sex with his mother, um, but he actually left home I think at 16, so he never had to. Anna Marie seemed to get the worst of it, she was the oldest, but Heather was a close second and she was also very much physically and mentally abused by her mother. She was treated really, really badly. She showed all of the classic signs of abuse at home. Her parents were constantly taught her, saying that she showed lesbian tendencies, which is ironic because Rose was definitely bisexual herself. Um, and this was basically because she would flinch at her father's advances. She didn't want to have sex with her dad, and so this made her a lesbian, apparently. Um, when she spoke to her mother about what her father was doing to her, Rose would simply laugh and say that she probably deserved it. And Heather spoke to her siblings constantly about how she just wanted to run away and get out of there. Um, and Heather showed all of the signs of abuse at school, all of the classic signs, and she complained to her friends about what her and her siblings went through. And the school did notice small things, like how Heather would refuse to change after a PE lesson, she'd never take off her clothes in front of anyone. But when people did spot her injuries, she'd say that she got them from fights with her siblings, only confiding in her closest friends what was really happening. Obviously there was a lot of schoolyard gossip about what would go on in the West household. Everyone knew that Rose was a prostitute, and Heather would confirm everything as true. Where the school never intervened, we'll never know. Heather, particularly, was failed over and over again because it seems like she was the main person speaking out about what was happening and nobody was paying attention. Heather left school at 16 in 1986 and she immediately starts applying for these jobs all across the country. She's just trying to get out of there. And every time she'd receive a rejection, she would apparently be heartbroken. She received a rejection on June 18th for a job as a cleaner that she really wanted, and apparently she spent that night crying herself to sleep. But by the 19th, the morning of the 19th, she was back to her usual self, which wasn't a happy, bubbly child by any means, but she wasn't crying anymore. Her siblings went to school, leaving her sat on the sofa, and when they returned home, Heather was gone. Fred and Rose told them that she'd been offered the job in the end, and so she'd moved to Torquay but this wasn't the case. Whenever somebody asked where Heather was, they'd make up all kinds of lies. But Fred would often joke with the rest of the children whenever they misbehaved, threatening that they would end up under the patio like Heather if they continued doing what they were doing. They all assumed it was a joke, but it wasn't. The story culminates in May 1992, when Fred rapes 13-year-old Louise, I think for the first time. When Louise confides in her mother what happened, Rose simply replies, oh well, you were asking for it. And these rapes would continue over the coming weeks, with Fred raping Louise multiple times, he even filmed one of them. And eventually when Louise confided in a friend what had happened, this friend told her mother, and this mother luckily called the police. On August 6th, 1992, the West household is searched under the context of stolen property. But what they were really looking for was proof of child abuse. And they didn't find anything incriminating in the house, but Louise made a full statement to the police, telling them everything, everything that happened throughout their childhood. And the next day, all of the children were placed in foster care, at least all of the younger children. And they had medical exams which showed proof of physical and sexual abuse. The children were all intensively interviewed by the police and they all mentioned one particular thing. The repeated threats of being buried under the patio, just like Heather. 
A full-scale investigation begins with Detective Constable Hazel Savage taking the lead on the case. Hazel knew of Fred West, she dealt with him years earlier when Rena and Charmaine were still in the picture and she knew all the stories about Fred's sexual perversion so she very much went into it with the mindset that there was something up with this family. She personally talks to Anna Marie who had actually already left the house by this time, Anna Marie was married, it was 1992. Um, and Anna Marie tells her all the stories of her parents' abuse while she was growing up. And Anna Marie also says how concerned she is for Charmaine because Charmaine was her sister, they spent their childhood together and she hasn't seen her in years. DC Hazel Savage had everything she needed to bring child abuse charges on the West but she needed to further investigate what happened to Charmaine and Rena and Heather in order to get the full picture. Insurance and tax records showed that Heather hadn't been employed or visited a doctor in four years, so either she'd left the country or she was dead. Fred was already arrested at this point and he was in jail. He'd been charged with three counts of rape and one of buggery and this would soon turn into a murder charge. Um, and Rose knew it wasn't long before the police came for her. She tried to overdose but her son found her. At one point the case almost completely collapses when Anna Marie and Louise refused to testify in court and without their statements they had no evidence. I don't know why they refused to testify, possibly they couldn't bring themselves to testify against their parents because despite all their treatment it was still their parents. And so the Wests were actually acquitted of all charges. Although luckily, their younger children still remained in foster care. The authorities weren't stupid enough to let their children go back and stay with them. And the parents were only allowed supervised visits with them. But with Heather being buried under the patio in mind, the police actually get a search warrant. And they want to search the house and the garden of 25 Cromwell Street. They're convinced that Heather is dead. The police turn up at the house with a search warrant on the 24th of February 1993 and Rose opens the door to them and she just turns pale and she gets hysterical. She's screaming into the house at Fred saying like Fred come here Stephen get Fred. She becomes abusive and she starts shouting at the officers and she just completely unravels just like on the doorstep she loses it. Um, and when Fred returns home from work, he actually claims that Heather being buried under the patio is just all rubbish and the police were holding a grudge against him because of all his crimes before and they're just basically bullying him. Um, but he knew that his time was pretty much up and before Stephen left for work the next morning, Stephen was older so he was still living with them, um, he actually tells him, look son, look after your mum and sell the house. I've done something really bad. I want you to go to the papers and make as much money as you can. And shortly after this, the police arrive to start their search for Heather's body. And as soon as the police arrive, Fred just confesses to the murder. He's taken to the police station and gives a full confession and obviously he's arrested. He confesses to strangling Heather in a fit of rage before dismembering her body. He insists that his wife had no knowledge whatsoever of Heather's murder. He even tells them that they've been digging in the wrong place in the garden and offers to show them where they should be digging to find the body. And on February 26th, shortly after 4pm, diggers find a human thigh bone in a section of the garden where Fred insisted that Heather actually wasn't buried. Um, they find a mass of human remains in a bin bag entwined with rope. Several hours later, it's been identified as Heather West through dental records. But Heather's weren't the only bones they find that day. They actually find a third thigh bone, which forces Fred to confess that there was actually two other bodies buried in the garden. And he agrees to go to the house to show them where exactly they can find them. He names one as Shirley Robertson and the other one as Shirley's mate, which it wasn't. Shirley wouldn't have known this other person. Leading on from the discovery of the bodies in the garden, they decide that they should probably search the entire house. And Fred actually writes a letter to the police saying that he wishes to admit to a further nine killings. I think he's just trying to get in there before the police find the bodies and it gets even worse for him. He calmly explains to the police that there are five bodies buried in the cellar and a sixth buried underneath the bathroom, which was originally the garage. He initially claims that he only killed them because they threatened to tell Rose of his infidelities. And he also says they were all hitchhikers or girls he picked up at bus stops. And between the 5th of March and the 8th of March, police find the rest of the bodies, all six of them. They all showed signs of severe mutilation and torture, but lining up the bodies with the names was not an easy task. Fred either refused to tell them the names and details, 
or Fred genuinely couldn't remember. Interestingly, Fred did everything he could whilst he was in prison to keep Rose looking innocent. He insisted that she knew nothing of the murders and he did it all alone. And despite this, of course, she was still arrested because the police weren't stupid. So she was arrested on the 20th of April, 1994. And they initially arrested her on historic charges relating to the rape of an 11 year old girl and the assault of an eight year old boy back in the mid 70s. She was questioned extensively and she was eventually charged with the murder of Linda Goff on the 25th of April. By May 6th, Fred and Rose were jointly charged with five counts of murder, with Rose insisting her innocence on every single one. After this, Fred also confesses to the murders of Charmaine and Rena and to knowing where Anne McFall was buried, but interestingly actually refuses to admit to this particular murder. And it's also interesting that he had nothing to do with Charmaine's murder. That one was all on Rose, but he still confesses to it. On June 20th, 1994, Fred and Rose were brought before the magistrate's court where they were formally charged with murder. Him, 11 counts, and her, nine. But he was charged with another murder just days later, which brought the total to 12. Now this was the first time the couple had seen each other since the February and Fred had spent months defending his wife and Rose had essentially spent the entire time doing the opposite. She completely ignored him in the courtroom. At one point he tries to put his hand on her shoulder and she just brushes him off and completely ignores him. He's devastated by her rejection and he writes her a letter. We will always be in love. You will always be Mrs. West all over the world. That's important to me and you. She refused to reply to any of his letters and she publicly declared her hatred of him. He was so heartbroken by her rejection and I find that dynamic just really interesting because as evil as he was, the amount of people that he hurt over the course of his lifetime, he was so, so deeply in love with Rose West. And he did whatever he could to keep his wife out of the courts. He admitted to murders that he definitely didn't commit, but Rose couldn't have cared less. But in response to all of this rejection, he actually recants loads of his earlier confessions where he says that she had nothing to do with it. He turns around and places almost all the culpability just solely on her. Apart from the death of Anne McFall, which he still blamed on Rena, and he blamed this on Rena until the day that he died. And talking of his death, Fred spent months on suicide watch at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham. But eventually, after a few months, this was relaxed. He was thought not to be a danger to himself anymore. But on New Year's Day 1995, Fred hangs himself in his cell. They find a suicide note in the cell along with him, complete with a drawing of a gravestone. And it says, in loving memory, Fred West, Rose West, rest in peace when no shadow falls. In perfect peace, he waits for Rose his wife. So Fred West never made it to trial. He took the coward's way out. He committed suicide. But Rose did on October 3rd, 1995. She pleads guilty to 10 counts of murder. After Fred's death, Charmaine's murder was added to Rose's original nine counts and two counts of rape and indecent assault on young girls were dropped. And the prosecution constructed a foolproof story of all of this evidence that showed that Rose knew what she was doing. They insisted that the murders had a feminine touch to them. And the defense tried to take the angle of sexual assault not being the same as murder. They argued that Rose sexually assaulted all these people, but she didn't actually murder any of them. And she didn't know that her husband was murdering them either. But as soon as Rose took the stand, it became very, very clear that she had no guilt over anything, whether it was sexual assault or murder, she did not care. And she was just completely defiant. And this was, excuse the pun, the nail in her coffin. Multiple witnesses took the stand, including Rose's mother, Daisy, and her sister. There were family friends, and the surviving victims also took the stand, including Anna Marie West, who finally decided to testify against her mother, Caroline Owens, and Miss A, who I mentioned beforehand. And all of these people insisted that Rose was more violent and more aggressive than Fred ever was. The defense attempted to use Rose's childhood as an excuse, saying the sexual abuse from her father had basically messed her up. She was bullied all throughout her childhood for being overweight. But sadly, of course, a lot of people deal with these things as a child and they don't turn out to be the way that Rose did. Um, she insisted that she never knew any of the victims that were buried in her cellar. 
But the authorities had a secret weapon in the form of Janet Leach, who had acted as Fred's appropriate adult throughout all of his time in jail. She was basically someone who would accompany him to all of his interviews and things like that, and she was someone that he could talk to and confide in, and he really trusted her. So he told her everything, but due to confidentiality reasons, she felt that she couldn't really go to the authorities and say. And all of the stress caused her to have a stroke and it was only after Fred died that she felt she was able to go to the police and tell them exactly what he had told her, which is that Rose had a huge part in all of the murders. That she had single-handedly killed Charmaine and Shirley Robinson and apparently he'd made a deal with his wife before he was arrested that he was to take all of the blame. She actually testified in court and collapsed from the stress of it. After seven weeks of evidence, the judge instructs the jury saying that if two people take part in a murder, they're equally guilty regardless of who is the one who actually did the last thing that murdered them. On the 21st and 22nd of November, the jury returns a guilty verdict for all 10 murder charges and Rose West is sentenced to life in prison and the judge emphasised that she should never ever be paroled. She was incarcerated at HMP Bronzefield as a category A prisoner which is highly highly dangerous and then she was eventually transferred to HMP Low Newton which is where she still resides today. Rose West? is still alive today. She attempted to appeal in 1996 but it was rejected and then in 1997 she was actually given a whole life tariff meaning that she was never ever to get parole even if she was to apply for parole it would never be allowed. To this day she maintains her innocence and the only visitor and child she remains in contact with is actually Anna Marie who wasn't even her own biological child. Apparently Anna Marie goes to visit her quite often and the youngest children had their identities changed after everything that happened and they managed to stay pretty out of the spotlight but the oldest children retained their names i think anna marie even wrote a book about it all stephen west is in the media quite often in 2004 he was actually jailed for nine months because he sexually assaulted a 14 year old girl again like father like son i can barely even bring myself to think about all of the things these children dealt with when they were younger um, in 1996, 25 Cromwell Street was demolished with every single piece of rubble removed and destroyed. They didn't want anyone to take away any mementos of this horrible part of history. Um, and now it's just a public pathway. There are thought to be other victims, particularly other victims of Fred. There are 10 confirmed murders, at least seven of which were for sexual purposes. Imagine losing your life because of somebody else's sexual desires. That's just the worst thing in the world. The last murder was thought to be that of Heather in 1987, but there was no murders that we know of for eight years before that. Most of the murders were committed between 73 and 75. And this doesn't paint the picture of serial killers who felt this deep, deep desire, this urge to kill. I don't think that was their motivation. They weren't pushed to kill like Ted Bundy, who just had this thing in him that he had to kill people. All of their murders were sexually motivated. They weren't in it for the murder. They were in it for the dominance, for the sadism. They just wanted to fully control someone and death was just a part of that. I think the reason they went eight years without any murders is possibly because their daughters grew up and so they could use their daughters for their sexual desires instead of these random girls off the street. During questioning, Fred confessed to up to 30 murders. There are definitely 10, but I don't think there's as much as 30. Four young girls did disappear from Glasgow when Fred lived in that area and other girls disappeared from Gloucester when Fred lived around there as well. So it's likely he did have something to do with it, but it will never be confirmed. And that is the full story of Fred and Rose West, a story that made me feel quite sick whilst I was researching it. It really wasn't an easy one. As always, if you have any requests for next month's Serial Killer Spotlight, then let me know who you want to hear about down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.